Awesome, awesome. Thank you guys for leading us in that worship this morning. Again, we're glad that you are here to worship with us today and excited um, about what God is doing even through these last several months. Um, I want to just make a quick announcement before I get into the actual message this morning. Uh, in case you didn't see the Facebook video that we put out or received the email uh, that we sent out Thursday, uh, next week we will go back to one service at 10 o'clock. Um, it's just that time of the year when groups of people are traveling like in chunks. And um, so we're going to go back to one service. We feel like we can still social distance and be safe um, by doing that. Uh, still yet, no kids' ministries are back up and running until July 19th. On July 19th, we'll be up at one service at 10. All kids' ministries will be operating, um, and hospitality will be back to running on July 19th. Now, hospitality may look a little different uh, than we've had in the past, uh, but there again, that's just sort of to keep safety and those kinds of things in mind um, as we continue. I'll, send, I'll do another video this week and send out another email, but if you see somebody, make sure you spread the word uh, that next week we will be at 10 o'clock. And we'll do that until we see the need to go back to uh, to services. We are continuing in our parable series. This is week five of that. And you're probably asking yourself, well, how many uh, parables are you going to do? I mean, we've been doing this for five or six weeks. And Jesus taught over 40 parables. So I've got about 35 more weeks uh, to do this series, no, not really. Uh, we're only going to do actually one more parable after today, um, but we are continuing on in that series. Now, it's sort of quiz time. Um, if you've been here, you've heard me say these two things over and over uh, because I really want to drill them into our heads. First thing is, parables are earthly stories with an eternal purpose. Earthly story with an eternal purpose. Jesus taught most of his teaching is in parables, and, and so he, he uses an earthly story, something uh, the people of that day, even more than us, were very familiar with. The imagery that he used, they were very familiar with, was very common to them, and so forth and so on. But he didn't tell them that to just tell them some story. He told them that because there's an eternal purpose behind it. And now, I, uh, I've said this second statement over and over again this series Parables are always about people. people, right? You're getting it. Um, parables are always about people. If he talks about the parable of uh, soil, he's not talking. He's not trying to teach an ag class on what kind of soils there are, which kind you can grow in, which kind you can't. That's not what he's trying to do. He's trying to make a in that one the story of uh, four different kinds of people. And how they've reacted to the gospel, how they've reacted to Christ, and those kinds of things. So today we're going to continue on by looking at a parable uh, that Jesus talked about. One of the shorter parables, actually, uh, of all of the parables. Uh, in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And I'm just going to read the first uh, ten verses or so. Uh, and, and then that will get us into our message. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. And then he said, I tell you the truth, unless, you're, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in you to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting. So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the lake of fire. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. 
For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. In verse 1 we see that the disciples asked Jesus a question. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And if you've read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find out that this question comes up several times. It's, for some reason, the disciples, I don't know if they're worried about it or just inquisitive about it, but there's several times throughout the Gospel where they ask this question of who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus answers their question with sort of a surprising answer. He, he brings these children in and he says, he, he essentially says, these children or those who are humble like these children. Now you have to understand that in that day and in that time and in that culture, that, that children were not seen as valuable. So what does that mean? Well, in that culture, you were seen as valuable when as a male, you began to earn money. And, and as a female, you were seen as valuable when you began to have children. You say, well, what does that mean? Why, why was that the case? Well, you have to keep in mind that in that day and in that culture, uh, you were seen as a grown man and as a grown woman by the age of 12 or 13. In fact, most people in that day and time were married between the ages of 12 and 15. Now, we would not advise that today. Uh, don't, you know, I'm, I'm glad there's no teenagers in here that throw that back up to me later. Uh, we would not advise that today, but in that day, time, and culture, that was very commonplace. In fact, we know that Jewish boys uh, have their bar mitzvah around age 12, and that's sort of their ceremony for becoming a man. And so by age 12, most what we would call boys were young men working, making a living. So if your dad was a shepherd, you were probably going to be a shepherd. If your dad was a carpenter, you were a carpenter. If your dad was a, a religious leader or a Pharisee, you were probably going to go that route as well. And so at age 12, you're probably out there earning money. And that's when you began to find value. That's when the people around you began to find value. Some parents, some families, when they had a daughter, one of the things they knew that someday there's going to be a young man that's going to come marry our daughter. And as part of that process, he's going to bring with him or his family's going to bring a dowry, a, a payment of some sort for our daughter's hand in marriage. It wasn't just, hey, mom, I love him. Hey, mom, I love her. It was, it was no, you have to bring something to have our daughter's hand in marriage. And so if you were wealthy and had money, you would offer money. But maybe you didn't. Maybe you had a flock of sheep or some cattle or whatever it was. And you would bring those things, part of those things, and offer it to the family for their daughter's hand in marriage. So you keep that in mind and you understand how, how why when Jesus pulls these children into the circle, that the disciples are sort of looking sort of strangely. In fact... Just one chapter over, Matthew chapter 19, there's a story here. And it says, One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. Essentially, what they were saying is, he's too important to spend time with these little kids. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven, again, he says sort of the same thing. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. So you see, in that day and in that time, in that culture, small children were not seen necessarily as important. But in the eyes of God, in the eyes of Jesus, they're very important. Verse 5 and 6 that we read just a second ago, he says, So anyone who becomes... Who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. So these small children are very important to Jesus. And so he goes on to get ready to tell us, this parable. It's one of the shortest parables, though not the shortest, uh, that we read here in verse 12. Verse 12 says, If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others and, on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? 
And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than, the, than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. So he tells this very short uh, parable, uh, again, an earthly story, but he's going to make an eternal purpose, an eternal point through it. Uh, I want to share three sort of points that jumped out to me this week as I was reading this parable over and over. Here's the first one. This story is about the shepherd, not the sheep. This story is about the shepherd, not the sheep. Now, I know that just sort of blew uh, your mind. But, but here is this awesome story that we read about this little sheep and he wanders away, poor little thing, and he goes off by himself, and he's probably scared uh, because he's going to get uh, devoured by a wolf. He's probably uh, getting cold, and he might be hungry, and he might be thirsty, and, and the shepherd goes and finds him and brings him back to the fold. And it makes us all just go, oh, that's so sweet. Almost like a Hallmark movie, a Hallmark uh, moment. But this story is about the shepherd, not the sheep. Now, there's some things we need to understand about sheep to really bring this story fully into focus. Uh, first of all, and we know this probably, that sheep uh, are not wild running animals uh, because their wool has always been seen as valuable. They have always been seen as a commodity. And so if you see a flock of sheep, the chances are, the high chances are, somebody owns them. You just don't go wandering out and go, oh, look, there's a field full of sheep, and they're just wandering and grazing on their own. No, they belong to somebody, and so they are seen as a commodity. In fact, if you remember in the Old Testament, when you went to make an offering for your sins, one of the things, one of the animals you would take is a sheep. And in fact, one of the, what the scriptures tell us about that sheep is you just didn't take any sheep. You took a, a sheep that was without blemish. So again, keep in mind, their, their wool is very valuable uh, and those kinds of things. And so when it says without blemish, what it's essentially saying is you're going to give a costly offering. You're not going to go get the runt, the smallest sheep you had, the one with the broken leg, the one that has some skin disease and so his wool doesn't grow right. You're not going to take that one. You're going to take the best sheep you've got and you're going to take that and make it an offering. So they've always been seen as sort of this commodity. People own them. People use them um, for their wool and those kinds of things. Now, most of the time, sheep are very laid back. They're very chill. Uh, they're not really aggressive. Uh, the most you may see out of some sheep is when uh, two rams, you'll see them butting heads, uh, maybe because they're trying to figure out who's going to lead uh, the flock of sheep. So maybe there's a hundred sheep in this flock and there's some males and they're trying to battle it out and see who's going to be the leader. Then they get aggressive. Uh, there's that time of year when the male sheep are trying to find the female sheep and they may be fighting over the same sheep. And so they get aggressive then. But for the most part, most sheep are sort of laid back. They're chill. Uh, they just sort of do their thing. And their sheep are prey. Sheep are not predators. Sheep are the things that other animals are looking at to try to eat. But sheep, for the most part, they just graze on grass uh, and, and eat whatever they sort of find in that way. They don't eat other animals. They don't kill other animals. They're not aggressive in that way. One really cool thing about sheep is because of how their, their heads are shaped, they actually have rectangle eyeballs. And because of how their heads are shaped, sort of like this, and they have these rectangle eyeballs on the side of their heads, they have an incredible range of motion to see. Far greater than, than you and I do as humans. I mean, they can see way back here without even having to move their head. Now, one of the problems that sheep have is they have horrible depth perception. And so while they can see whatever's back here, they have depth perception, and so they think it's way far off, and the reality, it's really close. So yeah, that lion is closer than it appears in your eyes. And so because of that, they really don't have a defense mechanism against getting attacked. They are seen as prey by wolves and tigers and lions and, and those kinds of things. And they really don't have a great way to fight off an attack. 
In fact, the best way that they fight off an attack is to stay together as a herd. And if there was to be a lion or something come into the purview where they realize, hey, he's looking to get one of us, what they would do is they sort of circle up. They put the, the youngest uh, sheep in the middle and, and the older ones and, and the male ones and all that sort of circle up around the young ones. And they are sort of just the defense. And they probably know in the back of their mind if he really wants one of us, he's probably going to get one of us, but they're essentially trying to protect uh, their little ones and the younger sheep of the pack and, and that kind of stuff. And, and so that's their only defense mechanism. And so because of that, they normally stay really close to the flock. They don't just go out in a field somewhere and just everybody, like kids in a playground, they just don't take out like ants all over the place. They really stay close together, they stay herded up, and, and, and follow one another. And they follow two things, whoever that leader is of that flock, which is probably a male ram, an older one who has established his authority, and their shepherd. That's the two things they follow. They don't necessarily follow the scent of their nose. If they were to smell something over this way and say, hey, that smells good, let's go. They, they don't do that. They don't necessarily see something and go, that looks good, let's go that way. They follow the leader and they follow their shepherd. But obviously, in this story, one of the sheep wandered away. One of the sheep went his own way. One of the sheep took off. We don't know why. Uh, it doesn't say, and it really is irrelevant. But he takes off on his own, separates from the pack. And when he does, he becomes very vulnerable to an attack. He becomes very vulnerable to becoming somebody's dinner. Now, the shepherd could have said, well, I got 99 sheep here. I feel pretty successful. Today's been a good day's work. I got 99 out of 100 sheep over here. Or he could have had the attitude of, well, you know what? I only lost one. Only one of a hundred, that's not bad. That's not a bad success rate. He could have even asked himself the question, why did that one wander off? Why, is he rebellious? Is, has he got attitude? What's his deal? Why did one sheep wander off? Or he could have even decided that sheep gets what he gets. He chose to wander off from the pack. He chose to separate from the shepherd. He chose to put himself out there on an island um, so that he could be prey for just about any animal who would want to attack him. He should have stayed with us. He should have known better. He gets what he gets. You see, that's why this story is not about the 99 sheep who made it to safety. This story is not about the one sheep that was found. This sheep is about the one who went to find the lost sheep, the shepherd. Point number two that this story brings us to is the shepherd cares For all the sheep. The shepherd cares for all the sheep. He wasn't satisfied with just a a 99% success rate. He was not willing just to let that one go and not worry about it and I'll take care of the 99. He wasn't willing to let that sheep be out there and to be vulnerable and to be ready for attack and, and to even be killed. The shepherd went out to find the one that was lost. And it says in verse 13 that he rejoices more over finding the one than over the 99 who had been brought to safety. Now remember, earthly story, eternal purpose. John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life For the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him. And he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. Verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold and I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock 
and one shepherd. You see, flocks of sheep listen for the voice of their shepherd. If they're out, and you just got to, the practicality of this, if there's a, a hundred sheep out in this field next door to us, it would be impossible for one shepherd to, to run around and keep them all herded up and keep them all headed in the right direction. And so the, one of the ways that the shepherd leads them is with his voice. And many times the shepherd does not lag behind, but actually helps lead the way. Because remember, they have bad depth perception. So they could be walking along and think, and not even see a cliff that they're getting ready to walk off of. Or to see something that could be a danger to them. And so many times the shepherd leads them, and he leads them with his voice. Here's the third thing it brings us to. The story doesn't seem as important unless you're the one. In the story, I'm sure you've put the characters in place. Jesus is the shepherd. Uh, The 99 sheep represent those who've accepted Christ, those who have salvation through Jesus Christ, those who've asked for forgiveness of their sins and received Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's who's represented by the 99. And the one sheep who wandered off is, is representative of those who are still unbelievers, those who've never made that decision to come to Christ, those who've never received His forgiveness that He paid for on the cross. So how happy are you that the shepherd came to find you when you were the one? How happy are you to be one of the 99? How happy are you? But there was a day in every single one of our lives when we were the one out wandering. I grew up in church, but it doesn't mean I had salvation in Christ from day one. I knew Bible verses. I knew songs. And this was back when we sang, you know, the first, second, and fourth stanzas of hymns and, and all that. I knew all of that kind of stuff as a little kid. But it didn't mean I was a Christian. It didn't mean I'd accepted Christ. It didn't mean I had taken His forgiveness of my sins in. Until one Sunday night in Salem, Virginia, I made that decision to accept Jesus Christ As my Savior. At that moment, I was the one that He came to find and bring to the flock. Maybe you have a story similar to that. Maybe maybe it was as a young child. Maybe it was later in life. But, But you have a story where you remember where you were at. You know what took place when the shepherd came to find you. How might you feel today if you realized, I am the one? Maybe you haven't made that decision yet to trust Christ as your Savior. You haven't made that decision to trust Him with your life and to take the forgiveness of your sins that He offers you. And it should make you feel good today to know that the shepherd is still coming after you. Just the fact that you're here today to hear this message, to read this parable should tell you, even if you are that one, that the shepherd is still looking for you. The story isn't about the sheep. It's about the shepherd who's willing to go out and find the one. The one. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus says, says he answered them, If you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. And how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Sheep. It says, yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. Who's the one that's wandered off? Who's the one that the shepherd's still going to get? Several months ago in our church, we did this uh, program, this exercise, so to speak, of who's your one? And many people in our church wrote names down and we nailed them up here, stapled them up here to the cross. And and for lots of weeks, seven, eight weeks in a row, we prayed for these names and we trusted that God was going to work in the lives of these people and God was going to bring these people in. And that was many months ago. And somebody said, why do you still have this up? Because we're not done with this yet. See, Jesus the shepherd is still looking For the one. He's still going after the one. Diane. 
He's still going after Henry. He's still going after all of these names. He's not stopped. He's not done. You're in the fold, and that's great. But he's not done looking for the one. In my years of ministry, I've had the opportunity to to baptize lots of people. And there's been several times when the person I'm baptizing is sort of the last person in that immediate family to accept Christ. And I've heard comments like this before. Man, we're so glad that he made that decision to accept Christ. Now everybody in our family knows Christ. I feel like we're done. And you see, that's exactly the problem. It's a great privilege if, if your family members know Christ, if everybody in your immediate family and maybe even extended family knows Christ. It's great to know that someday where they're here, I mean, in heaven, whatever, you will all be reunited. But just because your family is saved doesn't mean there's other sheep out there that the shepherd's going to get. And you see, Jesus calls you and I to be part of the process of going to find the sheep. Matthew 28, just listen to this. It says, therefore, there, there, there. therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen to this verse in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You are part of the process. Jesus says, you, those of you that are (coughs) the 99, those of you that are in the fold, you are going to be my witnesses witnesses what does a witness do a witness gives an eyewitness account of what's taking place Jesus isn't asking you to make up some story about him Jesus isn't asking you to try to think of a movie theme and a movie that you could write about about him Jesus is saying just tell the sheep what I've done for you Just tell the sheep what your life was like before you knew the shepherd. Just tell that one sheep that's away what what life was like before you knew the shepherd. And then tell them what life has been like since you've come to know the shepherd. The shepherd is not not done looking for the sheep. And our question today as we leave here today is who is your one? Who's that one sheep that you know that doesn't know Christ? It's wandered off. It's by itself. It's vulnerable to this world and to everything that it throws at it. Who's that one person you work with? Who's that one person in your family? Who's that one person on your street? Who's that one person that you know? Because the shepherd is still gathering sheep. He's not done yet. So who's that person you know that Jesus would say, go and be my witness? You don't have to make up some story. You just tell them what I've done in your life. As we leave here today, I can just tell you there's all sorts of people. There's lots of sheep in Perry that have wandered off. There's lots of sheep in middle Georgia that are out by themselves, vulnerable to the attacks of this world. And Jesus is looking for some folks that will go and be his witness and tell those people what God has done for you. Here's what I always have to tell people. Your neighbors don't care about me. I've had people who've called me and said, my neighbor doesn't know Christ and and I'm going to bring them to talk to you. Well, that's all well and good. But, but your neighbor doesn't care about me. <laughs> your, your neighbor doesn't know me. Your neighbor doesn't talk to me. Your neighbor doesn't see me. But they know you. They talk to you. They see you. And Jesus said, would you go help gather my sheep? 
That's the message for us today. Who will gather the sheep? Let's pray. Father God, today I thank you for this parable. And Lord, I I know I don't know anything about farming or anything about shepherding or herding or uh, what it would take to to get a hundred sheep from one place to the other. But Father, the eternal purpose is very clear of this story. That is, you are the good shepherd who has laid down his life for his sheep who has bled and died on a cross for the sheep, who was taken down off of that cross and placed in a tomb, not for your own good, but because of the sheep. Father, today you sit in heaven and you look down on all of these sheep that are on this earth as we go through life, Father, and you see that there are still sheep to be gathered. And you call us, you command us even, as part of that process to go and tell others about what you've done in our life, to go and tell others about what our life was like before Christ, but even better, what our life is like after we've come to know Christ. And Father, there's far more than 50 people of names that we could put up on a cross up here. So the challenge for us today is, who's that sheep that's wandered off? It's one thing when we can sort of pinpoint or point to somebody in our family because we're we're close to them. We know them. We we, we know whether or not they've made that decision. But Lord, there's lots of people we work with. Lots of people we see at sporting events and games and tournaments and teams and stuff. There's lots of people that live on our streets or our cul-de-sacs or our neighborhoods that we see. Maybe while we go walking or whatever. So Father, today help us. For those that have been brought safely back into the fold. For those of us who've accepted Christ as our Savior. Help us to see the need and the command that you give us to go and help gather the sheep. Father, help us not rest. Until our days on this earth are done. God, help us today to honor the shepherd and to help get his sheep. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a song. And as we do, I just maybe just ask yourself who's that one? Who is that one person? Be quite honest with you, maybe two, three, four, or five. But at least be honest enough to say, Lord, who's that one person? Who's that one sheep that's wandered off that I could help speak to or witness to of what you've done for me?